issues that affect or are affected by interior designers and the industry. That's why every other month, ASID is committed to bringing you public policy content relevant to the industry and the profession. Today's webinar is eligible for one credit of continuing education through IDCEC. This afternoon, we present Standard Codes and Designs, a brief look at the International Green Construction Code, and Standard 189.1. The presentation will be guest hosted by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Our presenters are Thomas Lawrence, PhD, PE, Lead AP, Professor of Practice, College of Engineering, University of Georgia. Thomas has 30, more than 35 years of professional experience. He spent the first 18 years in the industry, and after he spent his, the first 18 years in the industry, and after going back for his PhD at Purdue, has been at UGA since January 2004. He is the past chair of the ASHRAE Technical Committee 2.8 and is a member of the committee that wrote and maintains ASHRAE Standard 189.1 for high-performance green buildings. As an ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer, he gives seminars on green building design at venues around the world. Dr. Lawrence was named an ASHRAE Fellow in 2016 and is a director at large on the board of directors for ASHRAE. And my good friend and colleague, Alice Yates, Director of Government Affairs for ASHRAE. ASHRAE Alice has over 20 years of experience on Capitol Hill in federal and state government and in providing consult and in private consulting. Before joining ASHRAE, Alice served at the General Services Administration, GSA, in the Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs, serving first as a senior congressional advisor and then as deputy associate administrator for policy. Prior to her work at GSA, she spent 10 years as a senior legislative advisor in the United States Senate. All lines are muted, but if you have questions, please use the question box function during the presentation, and we will try to answer as many questions as, as possible at the end of the program. Again, please use your question box function during the presentation. Without further delay, ASID would like to welcome Ashray and our speakers. Dr. Lawrence and Alice. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Did you want to also provide some information on the housekeeping slide from ASID's uh, perspective? Sure. Uh, as mentioned, this is available for one credit of uh, continuing education, and ASID will use the registration list to submit for credit. Thank you, Alice. Great. Thanks so much, Brian, and um, thank you to all of the folks that have set aside an hour of your busy days to listen to um, on this presentation. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, which will be provided by Dr. Lawrence, um, I wanted to provide a, a brief summary of what who ASHRAE is, what we do, and why we exist. Um, we're a professional society that was founded in 1894, so we'll be celebrating 125 years. Um, and we are a global society with over 57,000 volunteer members in over 130 countries, including student members, as well as members that are consulting engineers, contractors, manufacturers, design build architects, and many other uh, professions. I wanted to um, differentiate ASHRAE from uh, some other uh, associations in that we are comprised of individual members, and we do not have any company members. This year, um, the board approved a new strategic plan. The new strategic plan has a new vision and a new mission. Um, it's very outward facing, as you can see, a healthy and sustainable built environment for all, really showing that global reach of ASHRAE. And um, it also shows that our members are very, very much concerned about what their profession does for the rest of the world. And I know that ASID also has that focus. How we do this. Um, in addition to being a professional society and technical society, um, ASHRAE is also a standards development organization. We use an ANSI approved process and we are one of five ANSI accredited organizations to develop standards and technical guidelines. Um, ASHRAE also provides a variety of continuing education for industry professionals, um, and we also provide these to um, organizations that might request, request tailored education. Um, ASHRAE, of course, serves as a networking tool for industry professionals, and 
ASHRAE also serves as a, a pipeline for providing technical information to our members, companies, and government officials. Given this um, webinar series is about public policy, I wanted to provide a quick overview on how ASHRAE reaches out to various levels of government. Um, ASHRAE depends on the great work of its volunteer members. We have a government affairs committee that's comprised of about 25 volunteer ASHRAE members. Um, it is a global committee and they coordinate with all 130 plus chapters around the world. So what the committee does has very broad reach. We also have staff support and that's located here in our government affairs office in DC, um, including myself, we have four staff members. Um, on a biweekly basis, we put out a government affairs update and I would strongly encourage you to sign up for these updates. Um, I've gotten good response from them and while it's focused on the built environment, I would say that would include um, interior design professionals. This slide just shows um, what our volunteer members do. They testify before the city council, they go to different state capitals, they meet with their government officials, and they also write to their members of Congress and um, other officials to provide great technical information. Um, our office is involved in a variety of other um, types, of, types of activities, included, including the Government Affairs Committee. We also work with our senior officers, and they have a couple of um, DC meetings where we have like two days of meetings um, in DC. And this past year, we also had meetings, as you can see, in Ottawa, Canada. Um, ASHRAE is, has, has developed many well-recognized standards. Um, this slide lists a number of them. And with that, I want to turn things over to uh, Professor Lawrence, who will focus on standard uh, 189.1 and the IGCC. I'm just turning my screen over. Okay. All right. Got that. And you should be seeing it now. Is that right? Yes. Yep, looks good. Okay, good. I had thought I had set it right. All right, so, you know, thank you, Allison, and the introduction for this point. Uh, we'll give you. Uh, an overview here for the next you know half hour 40 minutes or so of some of the technical aspect of this but it's always good to talk about and see where we're coming from how we got to where we're at right now so about you know coming up on 14 years ago now uh, you know screen building council really approached ashray and suggested that we were needing for a, a code something to be adopted into codes that would reflect you know green buildings or, or sustainable building design, high performance buildings aspect. Uh, began work on that in the summer of 2006. Uh, it took about three and a half years for it to actually go through it and you know, finally get developed. In the middle of that, in the, of that process, uh, the International Code Council began their own parallel work for a while to uh, create a green construction code. There was various behind the scenes of what that would happen there, but so it, we had uh, the 189.1 was issued in 2010. In 2012, uh, the International Green Construction Code was released. And so we went for uh, several years where you basically had two parallel paths. Uh, the, the standard 189.1 was incorporated into the International Green Construction Code as a compliance option. But about five years ago, Ashbury and ICC reached this agreement that ultimately they would blend the two of them together. So starting with the 2018 version of uh, the building codes, of which the IGCC is one. The technical basis of the IGCC is, in essence, standard 189.1. So the, the agreement was ASHRAE would be the responsible technical content, and the International Code Council would take it and package it and put it in a format that looks like all the other I codes, you know, the building code, plumbing code, et cetera. So that's a, the, that, I think that was a really good thing in what is going about this. So this uh, new arrangement, I guess I guess I kind of a little hit on myself slide-wise there, you know, this started at point in 2014, 
Um, in the U.S. and Canada, ASHRAE, part of that agreement, ASHRAE will not market the standard of 29.1 separately, but instead will basically say, you know, hey, you should go to the National Green Construction Code. But outside the U.S. and Canada, ASHRAE still publishes and sells the standard 29.1. If you want to get a copy of it, you can go to Mexico. You know, in fact, I was in Mexico about a year and a half, two years ago, and they were talking about that there then. So that's, a, that's the way we got, how we got to where we're at right now. What the difference of this point would be is that uh, we speak with that city that the International Green Construction Code, you know, okay, I guess still ahead of myself, you know, the, there was an optional compliance path for the state of 29.1. But really now from here on forward, you know, we're going to talk about the technical basis of the International Green Construction Code. But in essence, that is standard 29.1. In fact, if it's, it's verbatim, word for word, it just looks a little bit different. The uh, package a little bit different there. So the beginning of any kind of building code, there's administrative portions to describe how you go through and uh, comply with that. It's a, kind of a checklist, in a sense, of jurisdictions to say, decide what they want to adopt and, and contain. And that's you know, actually would have been one of the big discussions that's going on within the, the 29 committee right now is, you know, where should we focus those recommended those jurisdictions? But if you go, go and compare and look at that, uh, the situation, you know, it is, we're, we're talking about the code. So, it's, you know, it's intended for adoption as part of the mandatory part of a building code, you know, for jurisdictions they have adopted it, uh, then it's part of their enforcement mechanisms. You compare that to like uh, the LEED program, which is a good program, but it's still, LEED is basically was set up as voluntary uh, basis. Now, there are some jurisdictions that require all buildings above a certain size to be LEED certified to a certain level, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, you know, that's really the basis of why USGBC approached ASHRAE in the first place, because, you know, the LEED program was never really intended to be set up as part of a building code for making it mandatory. It's not written that way. You know, so that's it's kind of more of a pick and choose of which credit points you want to go for. And so we see that the basis, we see the evolution over the last 15 or 20 years within this country, and, and really some parallels to other countries around the world of adopting and having mandatory parts of the, the building code enforcement process to at least incorporate some definitions of you know, high performance uh, topics. And though if you look at you know, the, the actual the title, of the standard 29.1, you know, the design of high performance green buildings. You might ask yourself, what if that was like to do? I'm not talking to my students or giving presentations to say, well, what is high performance? You know, defining that. And it's sort of implicit in the nature of what's written into the standard. There's no pure definition in there saying this is what a high performance building is. So, you know, it's you have to kind of read into that point. And it's, it's somewhat to the the flexibility of the committee is working on developing that standard and going forward to, to, to define this is what we mean by uh, defining high performance. So also kind of think about this, you know, it's sort of a, this was somewhat of a stretch or out, out of the, the typical box of ASHRAE thinking of people, at least most of the volunteer members of that point, because we're talking about for a, a, a building, particular high performance building. And if you're familiar, if you've done been involved with any lead projects, you know it covers a wide range of topics. So we're looking at the impact of the building on the, the site the, of where the building is built at. You know, it's looking at ways of you know, officially using materials and reducing overall maybe carbon emissions effectively from operating the buildings and, and encouraging and, and building and, and making the building such an occupant health and comfort as a key priority and water efficiency. And overall resilience to that point. You know, if you think about this, you know, it's a wide range of topics, and very, very diverse. Uh, in the process of myself being on the committee, I've learned a whole lot in the last 13 years or so. So looking at this point, I've gone beyond my own comfort range of what it was. And now I understand the small things that go into this point. So the scope for this particular standard, the reconstruction code, uh, it pretty much matches a lot of other uh, building codes in the South. In that sense, like we're talking about, you know, new buildings and systems, uh, new portion of building systems. If you go to renovate, say, the lighting or HVAC system, it would uh, fall under the jurisdiction of that, only that portion of it. If you're not making a change in, say, the windows, it's not not part of it. Uh, so that's where the new system is equipment there. Or, you know, if you go relocate an existing building, that doesn't happen very often, but, you know, have to include for that possibility. You know, it does not apply to, you know, 
single family dwellings, you know, multifamilies, three stories or less. Um, you know, though, and those kind of that parallels you know, the building codes in general. You know, most all the building codes are, are broken down by there. You know, you know, anything three stories or less in this multifamily, it would be it's basically the residential. You know, and there's a difference that, as opposed to maybe a high rise residential, you know, say seven or eight story condo development, you know, that is a commercial building and the ITCC would apply towards that. So again, because this, it is a uh, building code, a part of the building code process, you know, the, it's mostly written to demonstrate or show how a project team can demonstrate compliance with this code. And so with the project committee, you know, over time looking at this and seeing certain parts of this, certain parts of it within a certain sector, say within energy, are considered so important that every building that falls under this code has to comply with that. And then there are other items that we have that would be either the prescriptive or performance compliance path. The prescriptive path is other items that are not part of the mandatory, they're still important, and they're listed and say you would have to comply with this. You have to maybe buy a, a chiller with a certain efficiency or comply with the certain types of materials in, in the into your interiors and with the paints and things like that. And those are specific listed you comply with that. Or as an option. And this would again this is an either or you could go through and, and as you demonstrate that the performance of this building that's being proposed would meet in essence the what would, would be resulting if you did comply with the prescriptive compliance path. But you're doing it a different way. So that gives a, a project team an option, say, some part of the, the prescriptive path that they feel they either have a better idea or for whatever reason, you know, they don't want to do that specifically, but they can make up for it in other ways. And the end the result being a building that's as good as it had gone through the prescriptive lines. And that's, there's, uh, you know, standard 29.1 and IGCC is not the only one to do this, but other uh, codes processes that, that's, uh, or standards are out there that give an either or option to give people a choice of, of how they want to demonstrate and go through the compliance with that. Now, when I talked about a few minutes ago, I said that you know the, this particular standard in the International Green Construction Code covers a wide range of things. In order to keep it simple and, and not reinvent the wheel, there's a lot of other standards and uh, documents out there that, that anything that's written in code type language is, that relates to a high performance building would be fair game for being looked at and considered by the project committee for adoption into that point. So that's just a few examples of what we have went on there. So like with an energy, you know, it's adopted in fact, you know, the standard and, and the natural Greek construction code says you will comply with this particular standard 90.1 with respect to energy, except as modified in here within this code. And using modifications in all the cases are to make it a little bit more stringent, a little bit more um, important in, in terms of you know, what they're trying to achieve. So like, you know, the energy efficiency for uh, IGCC is more effect, more yeah, more efficient than it would be for the standard 90.1. All right, so if you look at you know the organization of, of the of the National Creek Constructing Code, you know there's various chapters that are listed in that point. So you got the first introduction, you got definitions, and definitions are really important in terms of making it very specific since it is a part of the building code. You know, what exactly is meant here? And then we get in chapters five through nine that cover the, sort of the technical aspects of there, with the sites and water and energy the indoor environment and the materials and resources. Then the last chapter of chapter 10, also applies technical chapter, goes through, you know, how you define the, the construction process for the building and really more importantly, how you plan on operating it. And that was really something that was unique when the beginning process was started for uh, developing this particular standard because, you know, you can design a great building and build it, but if it's not operated properly, it's not going to perform. And so we've at least included in there in the part of the construction documents, we have a plans for how this building should be operated to maintain the key uh, high performance features. One thing that's kind of important to, to set in this is that the standard 191 or the National Green Construction Code set the level of performance or specific type of equipment requirements. But, you know, as much as possible, you know, not specifying exactly how the design and implementation is done. Or you know, I know I can think of examples. Whatever we look at a specific type of uh, or a performance requirement, a prescriptive requirement. You know, one of the questions that was asked many times, especially when developing the standard, was 
you know, are there at least two manufacturers out there that have a product right now that can meet this? And so you don't you don't want to be uh, implementing uh, you know, inadvertently, you know, giving somebody a, a, a lock on the market or, or you know, that point. So we want to avoid that as, as much as possible. In there. So now we we'll go through the next several slides. Go through an overview, at least what was contained in the various uh, technical topics. And so in the site section, basically everything has now been moved into made it mandatory. There is some description of you know, where the allowable sites to build, where not to build, you know, you know, build this in a floodplain or something like that. You know, it might sound simple, but you know, some areas you know maybe don't have as, as a good say zoning requirements and some other aspect of it. Some key areas that are addressed, you have the urban heat island, and so how a building can affect that, you know, cool roofs, lighter color, reflective surfaces. We're actually looking at addressing you know light. The exterior lighting is a pollution source. You know, to think about what the definition of pollution is, is something that enters an environment that has a negative impact. Well, we're looking at, we're looking at in stormwater, the transportation impacts of the building, where you don't uh, protect the natural areas, and, and some of the more recent things have been added in, like you know, the electric vehicle charging stations. You know, the standard was first was written, you know, EVs were not really, didn't really exist. And now, you know, they're becoming more and more common, so we'll, we'll adapt it and, and include that, you know, more or less going to go, I guess, you know, the site is probably the best place to fit it out. Uh, water use efficiency is a very important thing that's coming about. Uh, you know, we've all seen and heard about, you know, the impact of, of changing climate and, and more likelihoods of droughts. We have more population, but we have the same amount of water, so we have to learn how to deal with this. And so the way this standard uh, and the code addresses of that. Uh, it talks about how we do with like you know uh, landscape irrigation, and I we'll think we have a slide showing how that was addressed inside the building. You know, it just specifies or mandates that you have uh, efficient, efficient plumbing fixtures, you know, the low flow type uh, uh, fixtures, so you have a specific limited amount. At that point, you know, that's the definition. What US EPA has what we call the Water Sense program that defines it's kind of like Energy Star. You know, but it's also mostly focused on, on water efficiency and you know if a manufacturer makes a product that can meet that particular standard in terms of you know a, a certain flow rate or a certain gallons per use or something like that you know, then they're allowed to put that water sense label in there and i've actually seen a few places in more like public restrooms and airports or something like that where they've and I've actually seen that water sense label there so i know it's beginning to have some impact around in the industry and then go forward. So look at the HVAC systems and equipment. Uh, you know, look at water efficiency, uh, cooling towers. You know, there are, are, are big use of water, if it, uh, water within you know a, a, a campus or buildings or an individual building. You know, like on our campus. You know, you might have saw that slide a few slides there ago. We had a severe drought about 12 years ago. So we looked at review. 22% of the water consumed on my campus was in cooling towers. And so if you could define an efficient way for doing that, you know, so we have specific provisions for what that would be, and maybe not as important for you all to get back and look at the sense of trying to minimize, you know, the water consumption, the makeup water that goes into in the cooling tower. So a lot of water is evaporating from that process. We're also looking at, you know, collecting the condensate from air handling units in, you know, more damp climates. You know, I certainly where I live that would fit into that point right in there. So you actually collecting that condensate. You, know, you can use it for makeup water, the cooling tower, or you can use it for irrigation, various purposes you do. It's just basically trying to minimize how much, instead of sending it down to the sewer and wasting it, basically, using it to minimize the potable water that's actually used on in the building site. And we'll look at with energy right here. And this, you know, we have just kind of put in perspective, this gives you uh, an idea of the efficiency level of the efficiency gains we've seen within the industry. And I don't want to go through all the details on this, but just just, just accept the fact that the numbers on there rep represent a, an average value for how much energy is being consumed per square foot per year within within a building. And this, okay, so we had an existing building survey was done 16 years ago by the U.S. Department of Energy, and this, so it resulted in 90. And then, you know, some people have looked at, you know, well, if we could rebuild everything with the newer building codes, it's back in the middle part of last decade, you know, like maybe 70 or 80. But we have, like, we've seen over the last 10 or 20 years with a strong push towards setting the standards and codes, you know, to make it more efficient. And so if we could go through right now and with the standard 29.1, which represents the IGCC, and rebuild every building 
per that standard. I know it's not possible, but let's say, you know, hypothetically do you know, that. There's actually energy modeling studies have done. You know, that 90 could have been turned down to 43, so basically less than half. And then we've had some studies going through, well, how low can we go by just the maximum efficiency? And then kind of looking at, you know, about 40 or so. So we're almost there in terms of you know, defining it to the maximum level of efficiency where we more can be. Now we go through and look at uh, the different compliance paths with, for energy, you know, the mandatory portions that are on there. Uh, they include some on-site renewables, like measuring where energy is going, and a newer one has been added for doing automated demand response. And then we have a lot of items that address uh, through the prescriptive option going through there. And I'll, I'll kind of cover fairly quickly each one of those. Uh, well, I guess we're not, you know, I guess we don't have, I don't have the details on there. I kind of forgot what I have on that point. So if you look at there, so one, I guess I'm back on this slide, you know, point out, I guess the on-site renewable, you know, that was a, was a key part of what the, the discussions were going on. You know, should we mandate that every building just complying with this have to have some on-site renewable energy system? You know, there's a lot of debate back and forth. We settled on, uh, you know, have the mandatory part, you have to be what you might call renewable ready. You have to be able to easily uh, install it later on sometime in the future. You have to structurally allow for the, on the roof if you want to support, uh, say, solar panels, uh, maybe include wiring chases, et cetera, to make it ready so you can do so. And then in the prescriptive option, it actually included a uh, section where it says, okay, well, you go ahead and install that. And there's also an exemption for if you're in a area that has a low solar intensity say the Pacific Northwest or around the Great Lakes region where, you know, solar is and as is, is good of a resource as would be in, you know, Georgia or Arizona, then you would go through and, and be exempted from doing at least installing that. I just was pointing that one out. There's a lot of other issues right there, but they kind of get into more of the technical details, stuff that ASHBRAE does and how we do at that point, but maybe it's not as much as the, the membership that's on this call here today it would be quite as interested in going through. So the performance on base option is kind of interesting to point this out, you know, so there we had all those items that were in the, in the prescriptive part of it. But, you know, I can see many buildings, you know, say they did not want to uh, install the renewable, but they have to go through and actually meet now a performance target of what they would be. And it used to be that basically was saying, you know, you build the building to meet the same level of performance and do the prescriptive path. It's gotten a little bit more complicated, a little more specific and focused on the different building types in that point. And we don't, we're not going to show this on the, on the screen right here today, but then it's all based upon the energy cost level. So then now we can do things and do load shifting through different times of the day. Maybe the cost of electricity might be different in the daytime versus nighttime. You could take advantage of that and, and, and meaning you're minimizing the energy expenditures. And one of the things that we want to point this out too is the difference of the energy cost or the energy consumption really um, keep that on there. Then the uh, carbon dioxide equipment, so basically defining it and measuring the CO2 footprint of the building is less than or equal to of a baseline building. And it's the definition for how you define what the baseline building would be. And when this uh, particular standard, 29.1, first was being thought about, the first came out, at least in, in the US and in North America, this was the first time that, that you know, a CO2 footprint was actually even addressed by something that goes into the codes. So there might have been some other places in the world that have focused on that. But in the US, that was a big deal. So we actually got that. One of the reasons that it's fairly easy if you if you meet the energy target, you're going to meet the CO2 target. But it, it forces the, the project team to go through, at least do the calculations, to see what that would be. So you not know what that impact is going to be out there. So we'll move on now to the indoor environmental quality. And so the areas that are of curious concern uh, for indoor environmental quality, there's a lot of aspects of that. You know, you know, indoor air quality is a key part of that. So we're looking at the ventilation requirements of, of how that would be defining uh, how much to go about this, the outdoor air delivery monitoring. So basically, you know, it's one thing to specify the ventilation would be, but you need to have a way to guarantee that you're actually getting it into the space. We look at for contaminant source control, and this is probably something that uh, the membership here and people listening to the call here today would be well aware of you know, the type of materials, you know, mold emitting materials, mold VOC materials, et cetera, et cetera. You know, trying to minimize the contaminants will be introduced into the environment. Um, banning smoking within buildings you know, within the US and, and Canada, that's not as much a big deal. There's still other parts of the world where 
you know, smoking in public buildings is still allowed. And so we're kind of hoping that makes its way out there. Uh, building entryway systems to kind of reduce uh, particulates and other contaminants being tracked over the feet. You know, we have a building for the purpose, but buildings for purposes for, you know, provide a comfortable environment for people. So, you know, specifying how thermal comfort is maintained and acoustics and, you know, the lighting, day lighting, you know, the quality of light, minimizing glare, you know, controlling of the humidity within the space so you don't potentially get mold and mildew problems. And then something was added on after the standard initially first came out was actually including the requirement for doing indoor environmental quality surveys of the occupants and I think there's a specification on how frequently they were done with the idea of you know if people aren't happy to move around you know let, let them get their voice hopefully it's still taken care of is going about this so the way we get the ventilation rates and the, and the monitoring for that point uh, again we saw earlier you know that has a standard 62.1 it defines for regular commercial buildings or healthcare, the standard 170, the space of the ventilation for the, for healthcare facilities. You know, if you follow that, you know, those standards are, are designed that they will give you good air quality within the space, uh, at least it should have been acceptable air quality in the space. And then we have an outdoor air monitoring station on each air handling intake. We measure that, directly measure that flow of air coming in. And then in the plans for operation in chapter 10, and we'll specify, well, here's what we're going to do if the measured air flow coming in is less than what we specify, less than what we want or, or is required to get the good air quality. You know, what, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to do, you know, schedule maintenance, we're going to shut it down, whatever. You know, that, that's more important. You know, the standard does not specify what to do. The standard specifies that you have a plan to define the building owner, the building operators define what they're going to do. And they write it down. Uh, other things, ways you can maintain, you know, good uh, air quality is, you know, doing, you know, filtration and air cleaning. So specifying minimum MERV. MERV is a, basically a, a measurement procedure for doing efficiency of uh, filters, air filters, particular filters. So uh, filtering upstream of the cooling coils. Basically, if you think on a cooling coil in an air handling unit, you know, potentially you get, might get condensation going on, particularly in the summer. So you got now you got a wet surface. If you have a lot of dust floating around going into that coil, you know, that could you know, stay into that, that uh, wet surface and that should end up you know, get a, a media buildup potentially for biological growth. It's not really a good thing. So we're actually filtering out to keep the, the coils clean. You know. uh, ozone cleaners, we have areas for non attainment for ozone. So we're moving the ozone within the space. Uh, make sure that uh, there's no leakage pathways around the filter frames going about this. And then we also look at the concept for doing pressurization control. And that's, you know, you want to maybe get into a lot of detail on that. But, you know, pressurization control is important in maintaining good air quality inside spaces. You don't necessarily want to be bringing in uh, through unconditioned air through spaces. So if the building is in, say, negative pressure, you know, it needs lower pressure than the surrounding ambient. You know, every time you open the door, air is being sucked in. Well, that air is not being filtered. It's not being mechanically conditioned, either heated or cooled. You know, and so you have a potential problem when working there. So also pressurization control also has a deal with the sense of, you know, different different zones within the facility. So you don't have, you know, contaminated air, you know, making its way into a place where, where people might be at. Humidity control is also another important aspect of this. You know, the idea of having you know, mold or mildew problems is, is, a, you know, is an area of concern. It directly affects uh, the, the air quality, the potential health effects on the building occupants. And so we include the requirements in here of defining, you know, making sure that in zone, the, the zones, with the climate zones are right here, uh, zero, one, two, three, and four, but basically in the, the more warmer climates, climate zone zero is actually like Hong Kong, something like that. Climate zone one would be Miami, two would be uh, Dallas, Texas, three is, is uh, North Georgia where I live at, four would be like the DC area. You know, so it kind of gives a perspective of where we're at from there. You know, so we have the dehumidification potential, so it specifies on there that you have the cooling coil leaving temperatures are cold enough that you would get the moisture out of the air, you know, condensation has occurred on those cooling coils, and, and, and you've got at least some humidity removal from the space. You know, if you think about that you know, from an air conditioning building, you, you 
don't like it to have it near a lot of humidity. It makes it, you know, not only more uncomfortable for the occupants, but also leads into the potential for, you know, mold and mildew issues might, might to occur in certain, in certain spots. So another way you can go through and look at in, in the spaces, you know, we, we, for an energy efficiency standpoint, allow for, you know, building systems to be turned off when it's not an occupied mode. Imagine a you know, hotel guest room, nobody's checked in yet, you know, they don't really need to have the outdoor air, you know, the ventilation here to that space. Or an office building, you know, at two o'clock in the morning was an unoccupied mode. But, you know, you want to go through, and as we shown here, the pre-occupancy purge, you actually turn the system on for a minimum amount of time before the place is scheduled for occupancy such that you, you flush it out, you get, you know, the fresh air in, into the space that they don't have, you know, maybe air that's been sitting around for a while that might potentially have some contaminants built into that point. So that's, you know, the definition of what, what to open both hotel guest rooms and also for uh, other types of, of spaces in there. Moisture control, you know, there's a vapor trends, you know, surprisingly or not, that the moisture can you know, actually migrate through the Water vapor can migrate through uh, building uh, envelopes, and you know we can actually get you know, moisture migrating through. Potentially, at some times, we can get some issues associated with you know, condensation occurring, like speaking of winter time, and, a, and a, a humidity, you know, moisture from the outside migrating through, and through or migrating from the outside out. Uh, you might hit a point where it actually gets condenses and inside the space or inside that wall and leading to uh, serious potential uh, material failures on that point. And also looking at areas that are sources of moisture, you know, kitchens and pools and locker rooms at that point. You know, those are key things to concern with. And then the museum spaces, you know, they're not necessarily uh, sources of moisture, but in a museum, you're really concerned in, in many cases about you know, maintaining humidity within a certain conditions so you don't mess up uh, the artwork or whatever is being displayed there. And so, you know, you find ways of going through sealing around things, make sure that the, the mechanical systems can maintain the humidity levels within as within the space as required for its purpose use. A few other things that involve from the prescriptive option that we have going forward, you know, looking at minimizing, or not minimizing, increasing the amount of uh, daylight that comes into the space. You know, people like to have natural daylight in the space. Some people like to, would just prefer to have that within their office environment. But you also have to worry about glare. It might be so, you know, shading of the direct sunlight on somebody's computer screen is a way of avoiding that. And also we have, you know, the prescriptive option defines a whole list of, you know, low and many materials, materials that have a lower impact on the indoor air quality, you know, there. And, it's, and if, the way I can imagine this, if you're familiar with how the LEED program specifies, you know, like those VOC paints, et cetera, et cetera, pretty much the, the, those exact same level of uh, criteria are written into the, the International Green Construction Code. They're not exactly the same point, but I know that, you know, for, for a fact that when uh, the standard was being, mission standard was being written and going through and doing, we, we looked at what we did and, and you know, pretty much, you know, took it as a, a good starting point to work for. In some cases, it were more uh, uh, extensive than what we might do at that point. Then we also, again, just like in this particular topic, we had an idea of performance options. So you would do daylighting simulation to verify that you get adequate daylight. So go back in here, you know, these are prescriptive parts and it defines specific things you can do for doing, uh, getting daylight in and lowering the materials. But, you know, performance is a, is a parallel path or is an optional path for doing so. You know, actually we do the daylight simulation, we do the lighting for presentation modes and material submissions. There's a whole uh, process and go through and you calculate what that would be. Personal opinion, those are, all those are fairly complicated compared to just doing the prescriptive, but you know, it does give an option for somebody to go through and do it. So the daylighting simulation would specify that according to the modeling protocol, you're making sure you have a certain amount of daylight on certain parts of the space, minimum daylight light daylight levels, uh, also minimizing the direct sun on, on office workspaces. And then that picture shown right in here is actually an output of the daylight simulation model. So you kind of see where the 
light levels would be within that particular space, and taking out office and stuff like that, you know, materials in there, get a value of what that would be. The same with materials, which is a standard that defines and uh, go through and, and, and summing up all the potential sources of emissions from all the materials within the space like, to making sure that you know, the VOC levels do not exceed a certain value as specified by a, a California standard that's around there. And it's a fairly rigorous and, and, and detailed process, but again, it's a way to at least predict that you know, the, the space is going to maintain a clean, clean indoor environment. Uh, now we go to the last tactical section, section we run in here, and the dive is building materials and resources. So this is kind of a real quick summary slide of what it would be. So the mandatory part of that, uh, you have a construction waste management program, trying to minimize the amount of materials that go to a, a land disposal, you know, construction, demolition, landfill, uh, where the materials are, are being extracted from, you know, or harvested or, or manufactured by, so basically minimize the transportation distances, uh, mold mercury lamps for like fluorescent bulbs, uh, setting aside an area within the building so they can actually collect recyclable goods. You know, it's just it's a designated set on, on the building plans. Then within the, the prescriptive option of that, you're reducing the, the materials that have a reduced impact. So, you know, you're looking at a certain portion of being recycled or salvaged materials or, or, you know, manufactured in a reasonable basis or maybe even bio-based. And then if you go through the thing about where you recycle, well, you know, a lot of the steel that's in the country in use right now, you know, basically is recycled. It has a certain recycled content. So, you know, you can go through and document and see how much of the, of the uh, material that's being used there. And then a performance option is a, a, what we call a life cycle assessment. You know, there's, there are software packages that we go through and do you know, specify the type of building you have, you know, type of works constructed in the concrete frame and the steel frame and what goes into that point. And it'll give you, you can determine what the, by what you define in this building design, is it a lower impact building? It will be compared to, you know, the same old, same old building comparison to. And then we get in chapter 10, defining you know, both construction and then plan for operations. So within the construction process, we have a building acceptance testing or building commissioning, depends on the size of the building, of what that would be, a you know, full level commissioning you know, done for every building above of you know, 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, I think it's now been changed to. And then, you know, during the construction process, we're all aware of the potential for uh, the impact, at least temporary, on the site, you know, for erosion, you know, that minimizing the potential for sediment to run off. Uh, also, good air quality within construction process, not just for the construction workers, but really we're talking about the idea of um, making sure that when the building is built, it has good air quality. So you kind of see um, how well in that picture right there, uh, an example of a construction project going on of the, the AC duct or the HVAC duct work sitting there, but they, they've got the, the open parts of the duct work is sealed off. So you don't have you know, folding particulates in that construction site, which everybody is aware is a pretty dirty business for a while. You don't have those particulates folding inside that duct work. And then when they seal it up, they're all now inside the building. And then also another impact would be in terms of the, you know, controlling the moisture on, on, on materials you bring in. You don't bring in materials that, that's soaking wet that might become a mold and mildew issue. And then also, you know, the constructing vehicles. And this has mostly to do with the vehicle climbing, uh, the potential for, you know, basically the air emissions that would be associated with that. And then we get into the other part of, of, Jack, of Section 10, you know, this plan for operation. And again, these are... A part of the construction documents that are put forward. You know, once you get the certificate of occupancy, there is no really good enforcement way to enforce these. But the, the idea was that, that at least if you mandate that the project team and the owner and the and potential facility managers sit down in advance and document how they're going to maintain you know, the water use efficiency and the energy efficiency. And, and this idea of the indoor environmental quality back to that, that the outdoor air flow meter, you know, measuring the amount of outdoor air coming in. If it falls below the minimum that we expect for this particular part of the building, what are we going to do about it? You know, do we schedule a maintenance right now? We go back out and look at it, we flag it, and the next time you know, the building operator is out walking around and try to check to see, you know, if there's duct damper or a bunch of leaves sucked into the grate or something like that, so block, block the airflow. Then also has things for doing, you know, um, maintenance, you know, within there to find that point, you know, 
we adapt, you know, basically a good practices for doing maintenance on my HVAC systems, uh, the service life of the building. There are maybe certain parts of the building that you know, 20 years later, the manufacturer, that part of the being part of the building you know, recommends that you do X type of service for that to maintain its level of quality. Okay, well, 20 years from now, they need to know that. So that's documented down there. So hopefully, you know, 20 years later, the whoever is operating and, and maintaining that building will we'll take, take part of it. Then the last thing kind of pointed out here is how we have the transportation management. This mostly deals with the owner-occupied building or, or the portions of the owner of the building. I mean, obviously, somebody at least see the building space. You can't make them, you know, provide carpool assistance for their employees or something like that. It's, it's just not really going to work out there. But if it's a you know owner-occupied building, well, we go through and define a plan for how we're going to minimize the transportation impact of people and the employees coming to work that day. We encourage them to maybe carpool to minimize their overall transportation impact. And with that, I think we are ready to move on to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence, and thank you so much, Alice. Uh, we'll, we'll now take uh, questions until the top of the hour, so about uh, 12 minutes. So please use your question box to ask questions starting now. And Alice, our first question I think would be a good one for you to answer. Uh, one of our participants said that uh, she noticed that architects are members of ASHRAE. Would there be benefits to interior designers joining ASHRAE as members? Um, well, thank you for that question and the interest. Um, I would say yes. Um, you know, Dr. Lawrence has been a member for a long time at ASHRAE, um, and I'm on staff. But ASHRAE has so many different um, opportunities from education, networking, our conferences, our chapters. Um, so, and you could always, you know, uh, just I'd be happy to introduce you to like a chapter president or our, our chapter chair of our GAC just to chat with somebody. But um, I would say yes. In particular, ASHRAE has um, expanded its reach in terms of working with other societies. We have a memorandum of understanding with a variety of organizations, including the AIA. Um, I don't, we don't have one yet with the ASID, but um, we have a, a memorandum of, of understanding with um, BOMA, the Building Owners Managers Association, with IFMA, with some uh, federal agencies. So I think what that shows is ASHRAE is comprised of a whole lot of different types of people. We do have some requirements for membership, and I will send those to you, Brian. Brian, um, so that you can forward that to whomever has that specific question. And maybe right, else, I could, you, I, could, I could expand on that a little bit, just, just sort of more of a, just an antidote, I guess, because we were talking about before the, the seminar started. You know, I, I after a, because it now is the recognized you know, society expert, for one of a better word, the, the defining, you know, like a green construction code. You know, it's now it has a wider reach of, of the topics that are that the society works and covers. You know, I, I teach a course here at the University of Georgia on sustainable building design, basically green buildings, and I've had interior design students taking that particular class. So I know there's an interest in this kind of topic. You know, it may not be for everybody, but if somebody's really particularly interested in the you know, green building aspect of this, then you know, it's a good way of going about that. Well, thank you both. And yes, uh, we've actually had some people chime in in the question box saying that they would also like that information, Alice. So that's great. And, and yes, let's please, let's let's follow up about an MOU. I think that would be beneficial for both organizations. Um, so thank you both. Um, the next question I suppose could be answered by either one of you. Um, what goes into an ANSI accredited process? And can you please talk more about how to get involved in the development of the IDCC and standard 189.1? Uh, um, let me handle that, I'll tell you. I, I don't, I, well, I, um, I'd be happy to, to start, um, cause I can talk in sort of layman's language. Um, ANSI, the ANSI accredited process means that we have a consensus process and it, uh, it has balanced representation. 
in other words, we have um, committees that develop the standards and we have a certain number of people that represent various parts of industry, society, et cetera, so that there is broad representation. In other words, no commercial interest can be um, you know, domineering. Um, importantly, you do not have to be a member to uh, serve on any of those committees. The whole idea is that the committees are open, um, transparent, and all of the comments that come in, anybody can comment on our standards, it's all open, and we are required to respond to all of those comments. Um, I, I don't know if you want to add anything, um, Dr. Lawrence, but it's oh, a very, that's, that's a it's very good. rigorous, yeah. very open, transparent balance. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a very specified process that has to go through. You go up for public comments on the change, and you get the comments back, and you respond to the comments, and then they can respond just whether they're resolved or not, or they can still argue and be unresolved. And then, you know, that's a it is a fairly rigorous process, but that 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 purpose of that is to guarantee that everybody's had a chance to say it. it's not a unanimous, but it's a consensus base that you know, well, as a group, we agree this is what's good. The way to get involved in that, I have to go back and look, but you know, I think there's maybe else we can put them in contact with uh, the standard 189 uh, project committee. There's a standing special project committee that goes through and does the, the actual process. You could be a voting or a non-voting member. Uh, the only difference between those two is that you know, the non-voting member can maybe go there. You can get uh, volunteer working for one of the working groups. I can see you know, people from on this call right here might be very much interested in, say, the materials or the indoor environmental quality uh, working groups. And you know, those groups are defining, looking at the agenda that would go to the standard that would be in the process of going to the next round of the code cycles. Um, either you or I, can, I'm, I'm, I'm on this, the SSPC, but we can provide, you know, maybe uh, maybe forward on to uh, you know, your, your leadership here and they can by the way, at least getting the name of the, of the committee chair, because I, I believe it's, it's like an application type process. Uh, and I'm not sure, I haven't, you know, I haven't had to do this for 15 years, so I've been involved in the beginning. So I don't know what the process is anymore. And, and also Thank I you. Might want to add that uh, our winter conference is coming up. Um, it's uh, February 1 through 5, I believe, in Orlando, Florida, um, in, in February of 2020. And the committee will meet at that time, and I'll also provide that information as well. Right. That'd be mostly probably that Tuesday and Wednesday of that week. So it'll be like the 4th and 5th. Great. Thank you both. Yes, we do have a Codes and Standards Committee. It's relatively new. We uh, we started it last year after several years of not having a codes and standards committee, and that committee has been um, influential in the ICC process. We have uh, members serving on NFPA committees. Uh, we'd love to work with you and, and provide our expertise as designers uh, to the uh, to the IGCC 189 process as well. So, yes, please provide that information. We'd very much appreciate it. And and I think we'll have time for one more question here. And uh, if you haven't had your question answered, please send them to me. I can send them on to uh, to Alice and Dr. Lawrence. But um, for both of you, or, or perhaps uh, Dr. Lawrence, you'd probably have a better idea about this. Do you notice a preference preference amongst design and project teams of prescription or performance based based pathways using one of those? Yeah, that's a good question. And then, you know, like I tell people, I uh, I think it really depends on the topic. And like I kind of maybe alluded to a little bit and say with regard to energy, uh, I could see being a preference to go into the performance path, although it does involve like doing the energy model, but it gives them more flexibility. And then in, in the indoor environmental quality, just because of the performance option, the way it's set up, you know, it's fairly uh, rigorous and detailed and difficult go through and do a daylighting simulation modeling. You know, daylight modeling software packages are pretty expensive. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I guess the answer is it, it probably depends on the topic. And each of the topics are, in general, uh, more 
more likely to be done one way or the other. You know, the good thing about the, the IGCC, you know, you don't have to do performance everywhere or prescriptive in all the topics. So you can do, you know, performance and energy and prescriptive in IEQ and, and prescriptive in water and, you know, performance in materials. You, know, it, it's a, it, you have your choice on that to do that way from there. So the answer is, you know, it, it, it depends on the type of topic that would be. Uh, probably when you go through and look at it from an overall uh, weighted basis and what they probably still more prescriptive than performance, but in some cases, like in like in energy, it's uh, maybe more likely to be in performance. Great, thank you for that information. And and I'll end with just a comment here, a uh, an accolade for uh, for ASHRAE says. As a building codes instructor for many years, it's been confusing trying to explain the difference between the IDCC and ASHRAE 189.1. Glad to see the clarification and integration of the two standards, of, of the standards into the code. So well done uh, to ASHRAE and to my friends over at ICC. Sounds like it's, uh, it's a good collaboration. Um, so we're almost at the top of the hour here, so that will conclude today's session. Thank you to Dr. Lawrence and Alice and ASHRAE for hosting today's wonderful program. We look forward to hosting all of you on our next joint profession-wide public policy webinar in January, where ASID's Codes and Standards Committee will update you on their work. Additionally, on December 11th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, ASID and IIDA will jointly host our next advocacy training webinar at 2 p.m. Eastern. All are welcome, so please stay tuned to your emails for, for further details. We hope you enjoyed today's session and that you'll tell your colleagues and chapter members about these webinars. And as always, for up to, up to the minute advocacy and public policy information and updates, join our phone to action alert system by texting the term interior design. Again, that's interior design to the number 52886. That's interior design to the number 52886. Thank you so much to Ashray and have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.